In today's video, we will address the question, what is the best way to study and learn anything by applying scientifically proven study techniques? We will learn classic psychology concepts like the forgetting curve and the spacing effect from the work of German memory researcher Hermann Ebbinghaus, more recent evidence from neurosciences and cognitive psychology, and key ideas from the book Learning How to Learn from Barbara Oakley and Terence Sejanovsky. As bonus content at the end, we will talk about how to optimize your strengths to learn things outside of your primary focus to become more creative at your current job or business. Timestamps are in the description below, so feel free to jump around to a different section if you'd like. I remember the days when I was a medical student. My friends and I would spend every evening in the library, studied in a way that felt intuitive, started reading big medical books cover to cover, highlighting everything that's important. We took extensive notes and regurgitated them successfully in our exams. Studies from psychology show that this is a very inefficient way to learn. I still remember the best students and those who achieved the most success in their careers approached it very differently. These students were often found outside the library or in the cafeteria, acting like professors themselves. They could teach complex concepts clearly without referring to their notes. As Cal Newport says, if you can explain it, you understand it. It's the best way to cement information. It's a harder process, but you're more likely to remember the information long-term and use it effectively. The most effective learning method is active recall. At its essence, this is a retrieval practice. When you actively stimulate your memory, it's when your brain has to dig deep into its vast storehouse of information and look for that one specific fact or answer you're looking for. When it comes to studying, students usually try to read their notes over and over again to memorize the information. This is called passive learning or cramming. We've all done it, I know. However, passive learning doesn't necessarily improve your level of understanding. Students who practice active recall have improved retention of material, test scores, and overall do better in class. You don't have to unnecessarily complicate this. Just read something in front of you and look away from it and try to recall what you've just read. Another simple and effective method of active recall is using flashcards, also known as index cards, either on paper or digital apps. Write the question on one side of the flashcard and the answer explanation on the other side. There is compelling research published in the journal Science and other psychology journals that shows the powerful effect of testing on learning. When materials were presented to groups of students, those students who took a test on the materials compared to those who did not did much better. Repeated retrieval practice enhanced long-term retention, whereas repeated studying produced essentially no benefit, especially once an item could be recalled from memory. It was essentially found that what matters most for recalling information is how much and how often you test yourself on it using active recall. In other words, trying to remember information from scratch helps you learn that information and permanently remember it much faster. Faster. For hands-on skills such as driving, training to be a pilot or a radiologist, practicing doing the work is active recall. For these critical skills, watching can be assumed as learning, which is why almost all trainee medical jobs are essentially apprenticeships. Practice problems are another great way to test your knowledge before a test to figure out your knowledge gaps. When I was preparing for medical school entrance exams, my study partner and I put in the same amount of studying but I devoted my afternoons to taking practice questions and would research the answers to fill my knowledge gaps. Needless to say, I performed much better. Use of mnemonic techniques is one of the best methods to increase the strength of memory by creating mental pictures, especially when the concept isn't visual. For example, if you're trying to memorize the biologic taxonomy, remember that from high school days, you could come up with a mnemonic sentence King Philip cleaned orange fungus off Jenny's spectacles. This connects the abstract taxonomy to a scene you can visualize. Then to make it more memorable, you could add more sensory detail and some humor. Why did Jenny have orange fungus on her spectacles? And how did she get King Philip to clean it? John Medina in his book, Brain Rules, explains how 50% of our neurons are devoted to visual information, a concept easy for radiologists to understand. In our practice, we almost never forget an image we've seen previously. 
This is why there is no substitute for physician experience. Same reason, when we prepare for our certifying examinations, our residents see thousands of cases in the months leading up to the big test. To understand spaced repetition, let's first understand the forgetting curve. This shows how information is lost over time when there's no attempt to retain it in a matter of days or weeks unless we consciously review the learned material again. Ebbinghaus's premise was that each repetition in learning increases the optimal interval before the next repetition is needed. For near perfect retention, initial repetitions may have to be made within days, but later on they can be made after years. He discovered that information is easier to recall when it's built upon things you already know and the forgetting curve was flattened by every repetition. Later research also suggested the more information was originally learned, the slower the forgetting rate would be. Spending time each day to remember information will greatly decrease the effects of the forgetting curve. Some learning consultants claim reviewing materials in the first 24 hours after learning information is the optimum time to actively recall the content and reset the forgetting curve. Now let's talk about spaced repetition. In simple terms, it is much better to study every day than it is to cram everything in one big session. Again, this can be performed easily with flashcards. Software and flashcard applications shows the newly introduced and more difficult flashcards more frequently, while the older and less difficult flashcards are shown less frequently. Studying in this way allows more information to be encoded into long-term memory by space study sessions. Interleaving is the practice of an assortment of concepts together rather than a single one. For example, when teaching math to kids, give them a mix of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division problems. Interleaving provides a better understanding of concept and promotes better long-term retention and has been shown to improve school grades. I remember a friend in medical school studying at least three subjects every day for improved learning and retention. For experts in a field, it helps to study different subjects for a while, an idea described as combinatory play. The founder of Pixar, Ed Catmull, set up Pixar University where Pixar employees could take classes in sculpting, juggling, which led to better creative insights for his employees. Skim books first. Some of the best books I have read have illustrations that get imprinted in memory and often books are written around a concept that can be brought down to a few images. In fact, most speed reading courses will teach you to skim a book before you actually read it in detail. Adler and Van Doren in their book, How to Read a Book, call this inspectional reading, trying to understand a book's main points and structure. This can be easily done with reading the table of contents, index, and key paragraphs from major chapters. I remember in medical school, I chose a bigger book to study physiology because it had better illustrations over a smaller, more concise book for improved understanding. Multi-sensory learning style. I've used it for a few years now. To get the most out of my favorite books, I read them and then I listen to them in an audiobook format during my work commute. This work style works well because the more inputs your brain receives from more senses, the more synaptic connections are formed in our brains. Also study in different locations to ensure that your brain does not subconsciously associate the subject to a certain environment. I now have a thinking desk free of technology where I read and reread critical concept of the subjects I'm trying to learn. Alternate between different modes of thinking. Oakley and Sejanovsky describe this as focused and diffuse thinking. Focus thinking happens when you are focused on trying to solve a specific problem. When you do this, you are using a specific set of neurons. Think of a pinball machine. While diffuse thinking happens when you let your mind wander, not thinking of anything in particular. Diffuse thinking was used by Salvatore Dali when he would hold keys and try to fall asleep on a chair. When the keys would fall, it would make him wake up and he would go back to his work. Thomas Edison's used ball bearings and essentially did the same thing. Diffuse thinking uses diverse part of your brains to generate creative solutions to help see the big picture. Two interesting diffuse thinking tactics are doing mundane tasks like folding laundry or doing dishes like Jeff Bezos is famously known to do. And putting yourself in someone else's shoes to see the problem from a different angle and come up with a creative solution. Stimulate neuron growth. Synapse are connections between neurons or brain cells. 
The stronger the synapse is, the easier it is to recall information. Strength of the synapse is enhanced by myelin, a substance that coats the arms of neurons. Myelin acts as an insulation on a wire, keeps the signal strong, and makes sure that it is transmitted to the correct connections. By exercising between study sessions, we release a hormone called BDNF, which helps to strengthen the synapses but also decreases physical pain and improves low mood. Small arms coming off the neurons are called dendrites or dendritic spines. Dendritic spines only grow when you sleep, and also it is during sleep that the unused dendritic spines are cleared away so that the brain energy can be used to strengthen the most used connections. Matthew Walker in his famous book, Why We Sleep, describes how the brain has this most remarkable ability to distinguish between relevant and irrelevant information. So after waking up from sleep, we have a better understanding of the concepts and are able to better fill in the knowledge gaps that we could not before. Brain activity during sleep helps consolidate information, preserves long-term memory, and also stores information in a compact, well-organized way. While it's tempting to compromise on sleep, especially closer to exams and deadlines, lack of sleep leads to a buildup of toxins in the brain that actually decreases brain function and makes it harder to learn. We also lose the ability to focus, our reaction times are increased, and we are susceptible to major errors. Any doctor will tell you that they are aware of mistakes they made towards the end of a really busy shift just because they were tired. And I know of colleagues who've ended up with car accidents after a busy night of call, thankfully without serious injuries. Do the hardest problems first. There's debate about this one. Some experts recommend dealing with difficult problems when the brain is fresh, while others recommend solving easy problems first, like warming up before an intensive exercise session. Go with what works for you on this one. Chunking is a technique which means breaking down anything complicated into smaller, understandable bits of information and combining them into a more meaningful and therefore more memorable holes by making associations. You're already using chunking in your daily life. For example, when you leave the house, you might think of diverse group of items you need to take with you. Your phone, your wallets, your keys, your jacket. And thinking of them together helps you remember better. There's no debate about this one. Avoid distractions and multitasking. Keep your phone away, put it on airplane mode, and tell your friends and family to not disturb you for a few hours. Multitasking consumes a lot more energy than we think, and research suggests that it takes about 17 minutes to refocus after being interrupted. Deep Work by Cal Newport is a great book on this topic. Finally, while these techniques help to learn things faster, understanding things will not lead to mastery. Practice and repetition in diverse settings is how you will get there. If you're a teacher, try to incorporate pre-reading materials, use humor, compelling stories, and try to say everything important no later than the first three minutes of your talk. If you're a student and have attended a great lecture, revisit your notes and read about the topic before going to bed the same day and try to recall what you've learned the next morning. Now, bonus content. So how am I using this information to make myself more creative? There might be a few ideas in here for you. Now, I remember reading feedback comments. Hopefully you get those too from your students, colleagues, or manager. I read mine and a few comments stood out, like skilled ability to explain difficult concepts clearly, good presenter, and passionate about education. It's easy to find things you're good at. Just ask your friends. So I thought, what is something creative that I can do with these perceived strengths? I like playing with technology, learning things that I did not learn in medical school, as they impact my success much more than the medical knowledge I have. Things like getting good at storytelling, humor, filming, editing, sound design, as I explore new frontiers in my journey as an online educator. Nothing is more fulfilling than waking up in the morning and reading comments from new learners across the globe who are so grateful for the learning experience. Let me know in the comments below which of these techniques have worked for you and share your own learning techniques. I leave you with this video on design thinking, nine steps to designing the life you want. Consider subscribing so that you don't miss future videos on topics like the Feynman technique, on decoding greatness, how the smartest people reverse engineer success, Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.